Sunday last week, so I guess fathers don't count quite as much. But it's good to see this out here. Uh, I have been given the miracle of sight this week, so I'm going to see how this works out. I have never been able to wear bifocals, and my optometrist is much younger than me, and he said, I don't know if this will work on anybody your age or not, but he gave me some uh, bifocal contact lenses, and I'm going to try to read without readers to see how that goes. Uh, we do have some prayer concerns this morning. Uh, Beverly Woodard uh, is in the hospital and is having a variety of health concerns, and we need to keep her in our prayer. Do what? She's home. Back to nursing home. Back to Thank you. Uh, Blake and Lydia Carter uh, are going to have MRIs on June 22nd. Uh, they will see the doctor later that day and discuss the results. So they'll, I believe, the 22nd is tomorrow. So we want to keep the Carter family in our prayers. And Chad is at home. Uh, he had an infection out after his surgery uh, a couple of weeks ago and had to make a trip to the, uh, uh, the hospital. And they uh, gave Denise some instructions. I think she's uh, nursing him at home. So. Uh, we want to keep Chad and the whole Beard family in our prayers as they, as they go through that healing process. And Dalton and Kristen Path welcome Roland Asher Path on Sunday, June 14th. Six pounds, 15 ounces, and was 20 and a half inches. So uh, Dalton and Kristen are a couple that we were getting the chance to get to know and then COVID hit and uh, her uh, expecting they've they've been uh, with us at home, but we want to really celebrate that great news for that young couple. Uh, I hope they got their sleep because uh, uh, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a thing that they'll cherish. Um, since we were unable to have camp session this year uh, because of the pandemic, uh, you're gonna have a get together instead. It's gonna be called a day of camp. Uh, it's for all those that have been a part of the Shawnee Central Session at Burke Cabin, uh, particularly intermediate senior campers. And it's going to be Saturday, June 27th, from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. A van is going to leave this building at 2 p.m. And it's going to be in Perkins, Oklahoma. And that's the home of uh, Mark and Casey Stansel. Again, intermediate senior campers, if you... Uh, this time on camp this year, we're going to encourage you to come and have that day at camp. It'll be a good time to see some folks. And uh, since it's camp, you're encouraged to bring chairs, sunscreen, outdoor games, um, and uh, look forward to that. Uh, if you have any needs at home, if you need communion supplies, if you need help getting groceries, uh, if you just need somebody to call and talk to you, uh, need to have a contribution, picked up whatever, uh, please call the church office or one of the elders and we'll try to attend to those needs. We're still in a, uh, a, a unique and extraordinary time in our nation and uh, for this congregation as we deal with uh, ongoing uh, health concerns and an infectious disease. So uh, all those that aren't able to uh, meet with us regularly, we want to keep them in our thoughts, and if they have needs, uh, have them contact us. The Tifton Home Collection for the month of, month of June is dryer sheets. Uh, please place those items in the barrel in the foyer. It's all saying together, number 711, this first. We need to go for the first song, and now we've got the rest on the list. 
overhead. So 711 is your first song. True hearted, wholehearted, faithful, and loyal, King of our lives by the grace we will be. Under the standard, exalted and loyal, strong in thy strength, we will battle for thee. Peel at the watchword, silence is never. Song of our spirit, rejoicing and free. Peel at the watchword, loyal forever. King of our lives, by thy grace we will be. True hearted, wholehearted, fullest in legions, yielding his word to our glorious King. Valiant in never and loving obedience, freely and joyously now would we pray. Heal at the watchword, silence if never, song of our spirits rejoicing and free. Heal at the watchword, loyal forever, king of our life, by the grace we will be. True hearted, wholehearted, Savior of glorious. Take thy great power and reign there alone. Over our wills and affections victorious, freely and rendered and holy thy own. Peel at the watchword, silence it never. Song of our spirits rejoicing and free. Heal at the watchword, loyal forever. King of our lives, by thy grace we will be. Then Psalm number 682. 682. <clears throat> To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So lucky the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. The purer and higher and greater will be. I wonder our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Let us pray. Kind and holy Father, we're so very grateful for the opportunity of coming into your presence in your kingdom and in your family. We're thankful for the privilege of worshiping together. It's a joyous thing for Christians to be together. We lost that privilege for a short time. It makes it all the more precious to us today. 
We pray that we may never be deprived of the privilege of worshiping you and serving you in the future. We pray that we will always put first things first. This is known as Father's Day, and we're grateful for our fathers. Some very great men have been fathers in this congregation. They have helped to make it what it is today. We've been blessed beyond measure. We pray that um, we may recognize that the most important thing is to know you as our Father. And to be your children is such a precious thing. We pray, Father, that you will be with those who were mentioned in our announcements today. We're glad that Beverly Woodard has been discharged from the hospital. She is uh, in some very difficult and lonely circumstances right now. And any communication with her would be greatly appreciated. We pray that you will be with Blake and Lydia Carter later on as uh, they have procedures and decisions are made based upon uh, those things. We pray that you will be with uh, Chad Beard and all the Beard family. We pray, Father, that you will bless the Pat family. And we rejoice with them and the addition to their home. Every one of us is in need of your constant care and love. The young people, the little children, the elderly people in this congregation. Help them always to realize that they, in spite of feelings of loneliness, are not forgotten. That there are those who care and who will gladly reach out with the needs are made known. We appreciate so much the elders of this congregation who were appointed by the church in this place. We're thankful for their wisdom. We're thankful for their devotion, for their willingness to put other things aside and put their responsibility in your kingdom first in every way. What a joy it is to lift our voices in songs of praise today. And we pray as we continue in our worship and we listen to the preaching of your word, that we may be truly blessed by that, that we will leave today better people, more spiritual, more like Jesus in every way. Father, it's in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Let's turn to number 664. 664. <clears throat> There stands a rock on shores of time that reared to heaven its head so blind. That rock is left, and they are blessed who find within this land of rest. Some build their hopes on the ever drifting sand, some on their fame or the treasure of the land. Mine's on the rock that forever shall stand. Jesus, the rock of ages. That rock's a cross, its arms outspread. So let's go glory days. It's sad to this one day, my all I bring. And to the cross of ages fling. 
Some build their hopes on the ever-drifting sand. Some on their fame or the treasure or the land. Mine's on the rock that forever shall stand. Jesus, the rock of ages. That rock's a town whose lofty high Illuminate and unclouded light Hopes find escape beneath the road Where saints find rest with Christ at home Some build their hopes on the ever-drifting sand Some on their fame or their treasure or their land Minds on the rock that forever shall stand. Jesus, the rock of ages. For our lesson, we'll sing 847. 847. If you'd like to stand here, it's a song. Let's, let's stand together. <coughs> Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Be seated, friends. We will use as an invitation number 701. I'll be reading from John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, to all of you that are fathers out there, happy Father's Day to you. I think all of us who have had fathers and uh, we've all heard things from our dads uh, over, over the period of time that uh, they were with us and maybe you still have yours with you. Um, but there's usually one thing that stands out that your dad always used to say to you. And my dad stands out to me because he got said in this really thick Scandinavian accent. And he would always tell me, don't let them little things for you. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's great advice. There are little things shouldn't worry us, should they? There are much bigger things to think about. And in today's lesson, Jesus proclaims that he is the light of the world. And we need to hear his message. And that's what we need to pay attention to. Then little takes, shove them aside. This is what's important. What comes to mind when you read or you hear the claim that Jesus made that I am the light of the world? You know, sometimes we will we'll think of uh, a lighthouse, maybe just a light bulb. Uh, we've probably all heard sermons or illustrations that... Uh, have told us how important uh, lighthouses are along the coasts on both ends of our country and around the world in different places, again, keeping ships from uh, wrecking on reefs and things like that. Uh, but that kind of an image reflects our modern culture, and it's probably limits the perception that Jesus really wanted us to think about when he said, I am the light of the world. I can remember as a kid, Watched a lot of TV, black and white, 
on the screen about yay big at first. And one of my favorites in the morning was Captain Kangaroo. But before Captain Kangaroo came on, there was a little five minute program that was broadcast on the network, mind you. You'd never find it today. But it was called The Lamp on My Feet. And it gave a scripture and a little bit of information. And it was kind of your, your thought for the day. It kind of got you started. It was early in the morning, and, and it was kind of neat. And I remember that name, and it struck me because, you know, as a kid, I didn't know uh, that it actually came from the book of Psalms. But it is Psalm 119, 105. And it says there, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And there's no more fitting song to go along with what we're talking about this morning about Jesus being the light of the world than, than a passage like that. But Jesus was stating something far more important, uh, more powerful, more influential about himself and his influence uh, on those he touches. There was a, a man who did a commentary on the book of John, and he used the analogy of a body of water to describe the book of John. And I thought it was kind of interesting what he said. His name is Leon Morris, and he says, the book of John is shallow enough by its stories, people, and fascinating images for a child to weigh in, but deep enough in all its messages and meanings for an elephant to swim. In other words, there's something there for everybody, something that everybody can get something from and grow from. And for a lot of people, this perception of Jesus as a light is it's still that kind of a beacon type of thing uh, or a guide to bring people to God. But with the book of John, uh, Jesus is introduced in a number of different ways. Uh, one that just really stands out if you look at the very first verse in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God all things came into being by him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. But if you go all the way back to the very beginning, the very first verse of Genesis, look at how similar it is, what it says there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. So light has always been the primary thing that represents either God or Jesus. It is something that had to be there in order for everything else to be created. And you see from, you see from the verse that we just read in John that uh, Jesus is not just introduced as the light. He is actually uh, shown as somebody who was part of the creation and created himself. And the fact that he uh, is illustrated here as uh, light and life and the light of men in verse 4. Uh, light is one of the main concepts that John uses as he teaches about Jesus and tries to convey his message, and there's a lot of contrasts that take place between light and dark. There's a lot of various meanings that we can draw from it. Uh, the obvious one, of course, light and darkness. Uh, verse 5 that we just read, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You flip over to chapter 3, verse 19, and you read there, and this is the judgment that the light, and Jesus speaking, is come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. It's quite a contrast. John 3.16, there's another contrast, and it's a contrast of both life and death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So there's a contrast there. 
life or death, which one is it like to be? And then there's one uh, that talks about truth and lies. You gotta go all the way over to chapter eight to get to that one, but down about verse 44, John said, is quoting Jesus and he says, you are of your father the devil. And uh, he of course is, is talking to some people who are not believers at this point. Uh, and he uh, continues on uh, and says, you are, the, uh, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. So there's quite a contrast there. Then there's a contrast between belief and unbelief. And uh, that's found in John 3.18. says there, Jesus again speaking, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then, of course, day and night uh, are a comparison as well in John chapter 9. Uh, verse 4, while I am in the work, excuse me, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day, night is coming. Then when no man can work, while I am in the work, I am the light of the world. So lots of contrasts taking place here in the book of John as well. And when you get to uh, chapter 8, there's a huge discussion that takes place. Uh, and we, uh, we will kind of look at some of that this morning. Uh, and the previous chapter to that, chapter 7, uh, is talking about a feast that is taking place. And that is called the Feast of the Booths. Sometimes it's referred to as the Feast of the Tabernacle. But uh, it's, it's kind of a way of remembering. And in this particular case, Jesus teaches at the uh, particular, this particular feast. And what it celebrated and recalled was their time in the wilderness as they wandered and the wanderings of the people. And as indicated by the name, the main feature of it, of course, was the building of these temporary shelters. They could be called tabernacles or they could be called booths. And then they occupied them the families did during the week of this feast. And also included was a ceremony to recall the provision of water for the people and during their time in the wilderness, uh, and as well as the lighting of uh, great candlesticks that represented the pillar of fire that followed them uh, at night so that they could travel by night. Jesus alluded to these things already though uh, about the wilderness experience in earlier times in the Bible. When he said, uh, John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. What's the allusion to? It's the manna that was provided for the people as they wandered. And this is what was given to them by God for sustenance. Uh, John 7, 38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart shall flow, what? Living water. God provided water for his people as they traveled and wandered for 40 years as well. So we want to look at those uh, two great facets of this me uh, metaphor. I am the light of the world. Jesus is that beacon. And it seems best to compare uh, this statement of Jesus in the temple with the things going on surrounding this feast of booths. Uh, all through chapter 7, it talks about the different things that are going on. His family is there as well. And uh, there's a lot of grumbling among the multitudes. Uh, some people saying he's a good man. Some people saying he's not. Uh, and all these things are, are going on uh, as uh, he speaks. And he does indeed speak. And he teaches there as well. And it causes problems for him, as it does, did so many times uh, when the Pharisees get involved. The Pharisees heard the multitude muttering about things, verse 32, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. They wanted to take Jesus in. They wanted to find out why he was doing this. Uh, if you actually go down to uh, chapter 8 and look at 
verses 14 to 19, the Pharisees, excuse me, start with 13. Uh, the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true because in the previous verse, he had claimed that again, that he was indeed the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, they're calling him in and asking him, how can this be? You're bearing witness to yourself. That can't be true. You can't do that. And Jesus explains to him in verse 14, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I uh, come from or where I'm going. You people judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it. But I and he who sent me, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. That became a little bit of a stumbling block because they tried to say, that's just one. You can't do that just for yourself. You have to have more. Well, Jesus now, in uh, fighting and refuting that argument, says in verse 18, I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So there's two witnesses. Why was it so important to have two witnesses? Well, one of the things uh, that, that uh, comes into play here, uh, we'll see a little bit further down, has to do with the death penalty. But before we get to that, uh, there's some things that uh, we want to cover and take a look at. And look at even uh, somebody like Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus was somebody who had spoken of Jesus as a teacher from God. He had done that earlier in the book of John in chapter 3, verse 2. Now, his discussion about witnesses is essentially to establish the credibility of Jesus as a teacher. And in verse, uh, verses uh, 14 to 19, in uh, chapter 8, uh, that, that discussion takes place, and Jesus presents that argument uh, from his side. So was he a teacher from God? Here, here's what we're going to find out. Was the fact that he spoke in a different manner significant in this regard? There's a passage back in Matthew. And listen to what it says. Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So Jesus was a little bit different in this regard. Uh, also, chapter 7, verse 46, when they sent those officers out to grab Jesus and to bring him in, they came back empty-handed, and the Pharisees said, why didn't you take him? John 7, verse 46, the officers answered, never did a man speak the way this man speaks. That was what they said. They were amazed. Was that significant? I'd say so, very significant. Then the Pharisees had the challenge on points of legalities regarding witnesses, and uh, especially talking about executions. And I uh, just mentioned that. Uh, it goes back to Numbers 35.30. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of the witnesses, plural, more than one. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. It might imply more than what was actually being said at this time, too. Because if you go to uh, the very last verse of chapter 8, while Jesus was speaking, this is what happens. Verse 59 says, Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Well, they were thinking murderous thoughts at that point. Uh, they wanted to do away with Jesus. But Jesus claims... Uh, in spite of their objections, his ad adherence with his mind and the will of the Father, uh, they knew he was talking about God. And in reply to the objection about the two witnesses, uh, again, verse uh, 18, he tells them that he's bearing witness of himself and that the Father bears witness as well. So he has those two witnesses. The whole point of the argument is to persuade the Jewish people to see that the law was not the end. 
that it did something else. What it did was point to Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39, this is what it says there. John chapter 5, verse 39 says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them, and this is Jesus speaking, you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is these that bear witness of me. Good point that he's making there. And then another couple that we need to look at over in the, the book of Galatians. And in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse uh, 23, Paul says this, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, and we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs to the promise. So he's making a very good argument here for all that's been going on uh, and, and the arguments that they were having against him. And, you know, you look at this and this discussion and really even through the whole book of John, uh, there seems to be this flame flickering, not just flickering, more like simmering beneath the surface of the Pharisees because they're worried uh, they're more worried about losing their influence and their power than anything else. Uh, they know what he's claiming, and they know who he is, but they dare not speak about it. They don't want to undermine their authority. And again, uh, chapter 3 of John kind of bears that out, verse 19. And this is the judgment that the light came into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. He's talking about those very self-same Pharisees there. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to speak it. They wanted to hold on to what they knew was wrong. They didn't want to lose their authority. In the next part of the discussion, Jesus is relentless in his insistence that, that he is not only a witness, a teacher, and a guide, but he's the source of life. He is indeed the light. And he even tells them that they're going to die in their sins because of their unbelief in uh, chapter 8, verses 21 and 24. He also introduces something else in the way of a thought at this point. He introduces terms like above and below. And he's clearly pointing to the contrast of earthly and heavenly things in, here, in this instance. And uh, he and all about him is heavenly. They, meaning the Pharisees, and their mindset is earthly. Uh, John 8, 24 again drives home the point that he's going to make even more forcefully in uh, chapter 8, verse 58. What does he say there? He says, Truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. In other words, he's been here the whole time. He's been a part of this from day one. And uh, he's telling them that they will die in their sins. He's... Uh, uh, saving lives, he gives life, he is deity, he's pointing that out to them. Uh, the I am that he uses there is in a tense that's called emphatic. It means that Jesus is indeed the giver of life. And it's, as he says there, unless someone comes to him and believes in him, that person will die in their sins. It's as simple and cut and dry as that. As the discussion slowly winds down now, Jesus very subtly hints at what is about to happen to him. If you look at uh, verse 28, he says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Well, what does that mean? That lifting up signified the cross. Jesus knew that was coming. He knew he was about to be lifted up in a very humiliating and painful death that would actually and ironically end up glorifying him instead of uh, making him into a criminal. 
Jesus' repetition of that phrase, I am the light of the world, in chapter 9, verse 5, he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And the subsequent action of, uh, of the man born blind uh, is a part of chapter 9. Uh, he heals a man that is blind, that's been blind from birth, and I think we're going to get into a discussion a little bit more about that next week when I get the chance to, because uh, that's a fascinating uh argument all through chapter 9 uh, about that, but uh, suffice to say, he heals the man, and they're not happy about uh, them healing him, and uh, again, he talks about what's going to happen to him, uh, that he is going to be lifted up, uh, and we'll look at that again even more so next week. John is relentless, though, when you look through the book of John and his presentation of Jesus he shows him as God in the flesh. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, again, really bears that out because it says, And the world, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. We're talking about Jesus. And Jesus is not only the light that pierces the darkness of sin, he is, as a beacon would be, uh, from a lighthouse, the source of all spiritual light. Have you ever really thought about it in those terms, though, how important that light is? What would you do without it? And the questions now arise, are you willing to be somebody who follows him and doesn't walk in darkness? In uh, chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Do you realize that if you don't do that, you'll die in your sins? He says that as plain as day too. Verse 24 of the same chapter. I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Is there anyone else in the Bible that we need to be saved by? No. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. All of those are some very sobering thoughts, and they give a person pause to think. What do I need to do? Well, and the answer to that is simple. You repent of your sins and you start your life all over again. There was a man by the name of Thomas Fuller who put it this way, and I really like what he had to say about that. He says, you cannot repent too soon because you do not know how soon it may be too late. Interesting thought, isn't it? As long as you're alive and you're mentally competent, you've got the opportunity to believe in Christ. But the second you die, that's a second too late. Sobering thought. You'll be lost forever. And I'll close with that thought. Think about that. If, uh, if you need to make that choice, you need to make that decision this morning, we'd invite you to do that. If you have any uh, other issues and things that you would like for the congregation to pray for as a whole, please come forward and make those known as well as we stand and sing. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. There's danger and death and delay. Except God's saving grace. His life to the cross he has given. Oh, come on, get you made. He's earnestly pleading for no delay. Tomorrow may be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. The judgment day, brother, is coming. Repent for that day. His pardon and mercy he offers. Oh, may what yet you may. He'll save you from sin and bring sweet peace with him. Tomorrow may be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. A whole lot 
That's right. I must kind of you here as we take it before the line. We pray our mind of the problems we're allowed to make, the blood of the shed in the cross. We pray for all living. We take it and take them out, please, in your sight. Please, Brother Christ, and we pray. Amen.
Just one last announcement I forgot this morning. Uh, starting this next Wednesday evening, we will have a singular class in the auditorium. Uh, very informal uh, and will be really spread out, but that will start this coming Wednesday. Okay. Closing song will be number 697. 697. Let's stand here. Thou art the way to be alone, from sin and death we flee. And the word the Father see, must sing him, Lord, my thee. Thou art the truth, thy word alone, true wisdom can Thou only canst instruct the mind and purify the heart. Thou art the light of winding turn, proclaims thy conquering heart. And those who put their trust in thee, nor dead nor hell shall Thou art the way, the truth, the life, rather than the way to know. That truth to keep, that right to win, whose joy's eternal flow. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we come here to assemble. Be with those that have lost loved ones and comfort them. Be with those that are sick. And especially be with the Beard family as they're going through struggles with Chad. And be with all the Christians that are struggling right now that they can find their way back into your life. And let's be able to this is lesson and apply it to our daily lives and bring us back to the next point in time. In Jesus' Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How are you? Good morning.